history perspective, the container brigade kind of got started because I complained, which I do a lot, that, um, <laughs> I do, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> um, it was really kind of a vision where I didn't like how big the cord was and how difficult it was to deploy. And for a class of users anyway, they didn't want to build cord, they wanted to use cord, operate cord. And so the vision was kind of, you should be able to go out, install a Kubernetes cluster or a Docker Swarm cluster or a Mesosphere cluster, and basically say, uh, you know, create dash f, here's the YAML file, done, and cord would be up, right? That was kind of the vision. The second part of that vision was a belief that um, VNFs would be container-based going forward and not VM-based, and I know there's some arguments about that, and, um, and we were working on both now, as Kobe came in. But the idea was this, it would just be a container-based solution originally, and you just one one command to Kubernetes or Mesosphere, and you're done, and you're up and running. And so there, there are two aspects of that. One was is how do you um, create a startup file and actually leverage the container orchestration system, regardless of which one it is, um, but <coughs> instead of trying to, what I, what I think XOS does today is overlap with the container orchestration systems. So I would see XOS becoming more of a higher level orchestrator, if you will, but we need to better leverage the container orchestration system, and that's one part of it. And the other part of it is, of course, how do you, again, work with XOS, modify XOS, so that when it needs to start a VNF or VNF chain, it leverages against whatever orchestration system it's run on. And so those were kind of the things. Um, We've done some work in Sienna in terms of React network programming with Spinetti, which Kent wrote, which basically touches on you create a VNF container and you augment that container with uh, connectivity labels. <coughs> How you want things changed? Roughly. And that container will go create networks in the back, or layer two connectivity in the background. Gopi came on, and you actually were looking at how can we, as we said earlier, hook up a container based. Um, cord, if you will, to, with VNFs that are container-based and also include in that same chain VNFs which are VM-based for those that need it. And that would also include potentially uh, leveraging a containerized version of OpenStack. Right? Um, so at that one, when Gobi came on, we kind of, the, the structure kind of where we're going modified a little bit, which was okay because, again, uh, the, continue, the brigade for a lot of time has been a lot of talk and less action. There's just no other nice way to put it. And that's because we need people to actually do work. <laughs> um, and that's why I'm glad you're all here, because you can all do work. <laughs> yeah. We're locking the door, we're not coming out until we have all the files. Um, so that, that's kind of the history of it. Um, I still, from my perspective, I still want to see a version of Cord where I just one command into the, the container orchestration system and the base system's up and running. It does mean that we, we take things like what we have today in Cord, the, the, the mass infrastructure, you know, how you build up the hardware and say, you know what, that's a prerequisite. I don't care how you get there, because every infrastructure probably already has their own mechanisms to set up the physical cluster. So let's assume you're done there. Let's assume this is part of your orchestration cluster. Now let's start the serious work of getting things up and running. Um, and then, of course, we got to figure out how to merge them. So that's kind of the background of it. I think there's more than enough work to get done, right? And, and I, unfortunately, I've been pulled off from Volta a little bit, and so I haven't been quite up to date with a lot of the stuff that's going on in terms of core directly. Um, I do have a strong belief that the that that. The reactive programming model that we've kind of started internally that actually is open source now is a good way to go. I think it's a more scalable solution. Um, I think it takes better advantage of um, orchestration capabilities, container orchestration systems, and, and can deploy multiples of those versus where XOS is today, which is kind of the workflow-based orchestration, you step A, B, C, D, even if you do it in parallelism. Right? I, I, I think that is not quite as scalable, to be honest. Um, not to say we're going to dump XOS, I think there's a place for it. I think it needs 
the boundaries where things are need to change. Um, I would love to see someone come up, and I'm actually very interested in what Intel is doing in terms of um, problems or, or how easy it's been to go from a VM-based VNF to a container-based VNF. Very curious about what you're doing there and, and you know, roadblocks or, or things that you address as you went through there. Um, I, I'd be, you know, going forward in the container meeting, I'd love to have you guys talk about it if, if you're able. I don't know. <laughs> Companies being what they are. <laughs> Just to kind of get the experience of that moving from one to the other. Um, I'm curious about people think, you know, when you talk about containers, there's Docker, there's Rocket. You can say Minident's kind of a container. Well, um, Minident orchestrates the Linux container primitives, right? Right, right, right. There's LXC, right. right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, look, they're all based on, this. I mean, the Linux based containers are all based on some degree of. Uh, namespaces, network namespaces, PID namespaces, user namespaces to yeah. create some degree of isolation without having replicate. Right, right, right. And so, you know, different projects pull yeah. these these mechanisms together, but, but fundamentally, it's it's generally the same underlying primitives. And then if you go to Windows or or ESD or whatever, there's other mechanisms for achieving this. We don't care about Windows. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um. Okay, so I think that that's kind of my spiel. Um, I mean, we can talk about where the work we need to do. As I said, I think there's work to, to take court and how do I start up as a within a container orchestration, and then there's work Gobi's been doing with um, OBS stuff. There, do you want to chat about that a bit? Sure. Uh, actually, most of the work is being done by uh, John and HW from the Connectors. The idea is um, again, um, this is this is an evolving architecture. Uh, part of the reason we are talking about this is so we, we think it's a good idea. We just like to make other things. Anyway. The idea is right now, uh, Onos requires, uh, John can correct me if I'm wrong, Onos requires an OBS based uh, network uh, that is programmable uh, so that it can deploy VNFs on top of it. So that's what it's using, that's the default. That's the default implementation of an overlay network for Monos control. <clears throat> there are OBS based. If we want VNFs to run as containers in Kubernetes, uh, they need to be deployed on an OBS based network for Monos to be able to control this. So um, I did a little bit of research and found about three or four major uh, OBS based uh, implementations for networking. <coughs> On top of uh, uh, for overlay networking for Kubernetes, uh, some of them are from Intel, but they all come prepackaged with either its own SDN controller, OVN, we saw one from VMware, uh, or they have some uh, additional bits and pieces that we don't need. For instance, one of the implementations had a Linux bridge between a container and the OBS bridge for uh, for this for the yeah. sake of IPAN. So uh, we needed something that is completely controllable by Onos, uh, so that it can, uh, it can program the code using Overflow. Uh, but that can also get an IP uh, uh, that can be a, by Kubernetes, so that it can be assigned to containers. So that is the deal. So we want Kubernetes to be able to recognize it, and Onos to be able to program it. So what we have come up with, and that's what uh, John and SW are working on, uh, are, uh, is creating a CNI plugin. Uh, that uh, will that will create an overlay network, OBS based overlay network, deploy uh, Onos VTN as containers in the Kubernetes uh, cluster that is getting created, and Juno is working on uh, re-architecting or redesigning Onos for that, so that Onos can recognize a pre-existing overlay network that was created by Kubernetes, so that when OpenStack deploys VMs. Um, through XOS, uh, it can it can it can inform VDN that this VM has been created on the same overlay network as uh, as the one that was created by Kubernetes. And when we deploy VNFs, I know that's a lot of words, but when we deploy VNFs on uh, like talk, as containers in Kubernetes, they are on the same network as the v, as the VM based uh, VNFs. So the idea is uh, to have a common overlay substrate on which both VM-based VNFs and container-based VNFs can run. Um, irrespective of how we view uh, the importance of VMs, 
this work for owners to be able to recognize a Kubernetes based OVS network is, uh, is always going to be necessary. Even, even if we don't use uh, VNFs and VMs uh, that open stack controls, owner still needs to be able to recognize an OVS based uh, network that was, that's also recognized by Kubernetes. So, owners or VTM will be forced to talk to Kubernetes uh, for getting the IPs of that, being able to uh, attach multiple networks to a VNF based container, and so on. So, Reprogramming owners or extending owners to be able to recognize Kubernetes based orchestration is a, is, is a necessity anyway. So, um, we do see this architecture as an evolving architecture with newer uh, requirements as we go along. But at least at this stage, I don't view the work that is happening with owners or the work that is happening for creating an OG, uh, CNI to be a wasted effort. Um, it seems like this has come to stay and can be reused for any purpose, a pure container-based uh, cluster or a hybrid container VM cluster. I think it's going to be equally useful. So, so here's where I'm going to push back a little, right? Sure. Um, why, does, why does this network have to be controlled by owners? That's the whole point of uh, what we're doing with core. So we have a reference implementation. Uh, I'm trying to answer any questions. You're saying we can use any SDN controller? Is that not even necessary? So, yeah. again, I think. Uh, because, because what they're doing is a very different approach. Yeah. Right. So, uh, with Spinetti, I mean. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and the question is. In this case, Spinetti yeah. is also behaving as an SDN controller. It's an extension of an IP table, uh, uh, the view proxy. With, it, it detects the uh, new containers and it, it routes the traffic between different containers. It's a, it's a more sophisticated view proxy. Um, um, and while that makes sense, um, I don't view what we are doing as something that competes with that. Maybe it does, I don't know. But yeah. uh, th this is a very narrow implementation trying to solve a specific problem. Problem of having a hybrid VM container based system. I'm hoping that at some point in the future, uh, we will be able to swap out these pieces. You know, we will be able to swap out the SDN controller. We will be able to swap out any uh, orchestrator. Uh, you also talked about uh, delegating some of the responsibilities of XOS directly to Kubernetes. Uh, that's very much on the roadmap. I think I, I totally agree there. Um, this is I, I view this as a low hanging fruit that we can solve, and then where the responsibilities flow, whether the responsibilities of an SDN controller gets absorbed into a more uh, primitive component in Kubernetes or we replace that SDN controller with something else. Uh, actually, I'm open for suggestions. Yeah, I don't, think yeah, I, I, I don't want to diminish the work history because I think it's interesting, right? Sure. It could be, whether we use it or not, we may use it or we're going to learn from it. But one of, one of the things I see this brigade doing is kind of challenging the, the core concepts of core today. All around it, right? Challenging its position of XOS, you know, with relationship to the orchestration. Challenging the way we're doing uh, SDN control, because you're right, but it is a level of SDN control, very limited scope. Um, and so that's that's a question that comes to my mind: is should, if we take a step back and say, look, we're going to blank slate it. We're not going to assume ONOS. We're not going to assume XOS. We're, if we were building this today from scratch using Kubernetes, what would we do? And I agree, we have to address the VM, the, the, that boundary case, how we that boundary border case, that's what I want to talk across the border that boundary. Um, and the question is, how would we do that if if core didn't exist today, and we're looking at a problem fresh, how would we address it? So if core didn't exist, or SDN control didn't exist? Because they're two different things. Um, if, if core or ONOS didn't exist, okay. right? If, if you were to you were to do it the perfect the way you wanted to do it. So CORD, we view CORD as a very distinct piece from ONOS. Yeah. ONOS is SDN control. In fact, internally at ONS, we view CORD as a generic service orchestrator. That's yep. it. Um, from CORD's point of view, ONOS is not essential. And I'm pretty sure from ONOS' point of view, CORD is not essential. There are several implementations with many network instances where CORD is oh, not yeah, yeah. Really right. So uh, it means different things when we say, imagining uh, uh, today, uh, today's you reimagining this entire uh, platform without God, or reimagining this entire platform yeah. without God, you know, very different scenarios. Without a, I, I think I can speak to the, to 
for the first scenario that you're talking about without cop without dot itself or something so or without xos xos is uh, has been designed from my point of view as uh, a framework where anything can be plugged in as a service framework so it's a, it's a framework of frameworks uh, you have some some new feature or set of features that you want to implement as a part of your orchestration platform. You want to add a new orchestrator to it that orchestrates a specific set of components. You can add that as an extension to XOS. So XOS itself is an orchestrator. Now, if we had had the hindsight or if we had had Kubernetes right. three years ago, maybe a lot of what XOS is doing would be delegated down to Kubernetes. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's still going to happen. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a draining of responsibilities of XOS down to Kubernetes as we move. And it's always a challenge. Do we start with a clean state, you know, throw everything out and then <laughs> start fresh? Agreed. Or do we augment what we have until we reach a critical mass and then we flip the switch? So, um, in order to not piss too many people off, <laughs> we, we decided on the later. So, we, at least I think it makes sense to start small, have Kubernetes orchestrate a small piece of XOS first, and then as a bunch of features from XOS get drains, drained to Kubernetes, I'm pretty sure there'll be a 50-50 mark at which point we say, okay, XOS is the orchestrator, sorry, Kubernetes is the orchestrator, XOS is a part of Kubernetes. If you want to orchestrate anything, please plan for orchestrating that using Kubernetes, but all legacy will be orchestrated using XOS. So at some point that's going to happen. Uh, or uh, they will, we will still have XOS as an extension of Kubernetes which will allow for third-party plugins to come in, you know, for instance. So that's its strength. Um, uh, I do see that happening. And that's why I see this as an evolving architecture. I don't see this as an either one. I, I, I guess, whereas, and I agree, you have to evolve. You don't have to jump in. I don't want to throw your I will ask if anybody has a question. Anybody just can talk. The other word, shut up. That's right. <laughs> we, we, we just you two, that's all. That's so, I was afraid of this. <laughs> anyway, so, are there any other views on what, what the problems are? Are we, do you think we're crazy doing what we're doing? Does, More importantly, are you does ready anyone, to help? <laughs> Does anyone not know what uh, Kubernetes is or how it works? <laughs> Actually, I think I'll have to leave. I'll, I'll ask other questions and I'll leave. Yeah. I have to leave in like five minutes for to another table. Yeah, there's the own app round table at 4 30. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think we have to evolve it. Um, I agree with that. I, the, the, I would, would like to have a better picture in my mind, but I don't have it today. Uh, the, the end point. Yes, you know, here's the end point, and here's the path to that end point, which is evolution. But I still want to have a better goal of what that end point is. And so when I say take a step back and how would I implement it today on Kubernetes Mesosphere, it, that becomes that vision, if you will. And then you can say, okay, what are the next steps to do it? Uh, that's kind of where I, how I see that yeah, happening. Yeah, so, so just kind of like there's, there's two different kind of requirements. Like one is the kind of clean slate, like you were mentioning, or something like that. The other is the the the, the need to kind of plan or plan the needs of some application or whatever you have. Um, I guess the, the interesting thing about the first approach is that. Kind of a way of like figuring out like yeah like say pushing the boundaries and then figuring out new ideas and figuring out how we can do this in a different way. Um, we kind of like a prototype kind of right? and then we can see like what works and what doesn't and you know how we can bring it out past the system into you know, a system that, that, that we can kind of show people on the basic use case that we can do. And I definitely see that happening as is Trying, being able to try things out outside of kind of a defined yeah, code path yeah. and figure out what, well, that didn't work at all yeah. and throw that away versus that, that did, we learned something from that. What's the next step? Yeah, yeah. Type of thing. Um, but, you know, in terms of concrete tasks, I still think there is a goal. Let's say there's all the Docker, all the XOS, the current images, Docker images are up on Docker Hub, <laughs> Docker Cloud, whatever, right? How do I go from there and I have a fresh system running Kubernetes as a start? And I don't want to get, I want to be very careful here not to get so bound to Kubernetes it's difficult to move to the next one. 
Um, you know, but how can I get up and running, assuming the internet access and the image is there, in one command, a subset of commands, very small subset of commands. And it also, I think, will give a better uh, separation between configuration and build that we don't have before today. I think they're, they're getting better at it, but it's been mixed for a while, where it really went very separate. Stages, and so I, even if we did that, I think that'd be a huge amount of work. That would be valuable because then you could minus download time, get things up and working fairly quickly. Um, download time is its own issue. Download time is its own issue. I can't, I can't, I can only make the internet go so fast. <laughs> you can stop writing in Python. Anyways. Yeah, well, how about Python? Now? Okay, <laughs> I'm a big Go fan, but that's okay. Um, so are people in general more interested in turning um, Cord into an XO or Kubernetes startup, if you will, start it that way? Or are they more interested in container VMs? VM, not VMs, but VMs. Okay, raise your hand if you're more interested in running Cord under Kubernetes. What were the two options? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the, the, the populace here. If they're coming from the, I just want to run Cord under Kubernetes or Swarm or whatever, versus I'm developing like Intel VNS that are container based. Or maybe there's a third option that I just want this to run as smooth as possible. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I think there is. <laughs> so I'll, I'll think it like, what if we can station service everything on deployment up to the VNS level, simply as a Lego box? Simply click and work. Build okay. your image, build your shape. That based on what you wanted, and that's simply just click it. Yeah, Go. yeah I, I, I think I've seen that in terms of building services today yeah. in Kubernetes, you're not Kubernetes, under Core. You know, you talked about, uh, Larry talked about today, you know, you write a file and it yeah. generates 92,000 lines of code. Correct. And I thought, that's a win? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe it's better than what we have today, where you have to edit all those 92,000 lines by hand, but that didn't seem to be where we wanted to go, right? Yeah. And I know they're working towards dynamic onboarding, but it'd be nice if I could develop a, a service um, where my synchronizer is a container with well-defined interfaces. Yeah. And all of a sudden, when I, when I run that, it just the, the infrastructure, whatever that is, starts up my synchronizer talks to those interfaces and goes. I, I don't have to worry about generating all this code behind the scenes. Is that what you're kind of talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes, like, everything right now, you look at it, how you want to put it together. Unless you get familiar with it. Put it yeah. on, on bottom up. Okay. You don't spend a lot of time worry about what is the config, what is the YAML file, what is, how you can place them, what is the topology you need to look like, where's the IP forwarding, where's it going to be look like, and you need all those prerequisites stuff before you can actually get the core upper one, not to mention any XOS after that. Yeah. I yeah. think the same problems exist uh, if you want to bring up a Kubernetes. Exactly. It's so, not like, yeah, <laughs> after you get up the Kubernetes API, everything is fine and dandy. But even to get up the Kubernetes cluster, people say it's a problem. So, so, so because, because all, also, uh, when you say card, card installer does a bunch of things right from the metal. So what you are saying is only yeah. part of it after the platform install and everything yes. else is done. So that it can be switched in and out. So you can't say the entire card thing is uh, orchestrated by Kubernetes. Kubernetes itself might need to be brought up using the mass. Yeah, well, part yeah. of things. I guess my assumption has been that carriers, as they're deploying, or anybody that's deploying, already have processes and systems in place yes, that is a good to bring up if they're, they're, if they're they're bring up their hardware. Yes, a command, like a bunch of machines. Yes. Bring up to the bunch of machines, yeah. right? And if they're if they're running Kubernetes, if they're a Kubernetes house, they probably already got those business those processes in place mm -hmm. to enroll that host at, in a Kubernetes cluster or create a new cluster. I agree that's a huge problem setting that up. Kube admin has helped a lot, but it's not necessarily simple. Well, it's getting simple. Um, yes, my assumption is that that part's done. 
now let's, you know, we're really just talking about running services or, you know, starting in swarm term stacks on that system. I guess then it would help uh, to kind of have a proper hand up uh, place within today's card in such yeah. and then say, okay, at this point onwards, we assume that uh, Kubernetes is set up already. Yeah. If you don't have it, you can use these previous steps that to set this up. Yeah. And then just run this YAML file and make it come. And we've, well, there's been talk on discussion lists about that to say, can we separate mass yeah, off? Yeah. And you know, I, I developed a lot of that mass stuff, so I'm, if anybody's religious about it, it's me and I'm not. I'm like, let's get rid of it if we have to, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and, and make that separation, because I know what a pain it is. Um, yeah, you absolutely need that handoff, because I think we, we need a way to say, I'm going to deploy cord, but I've already got my infrastructure. I've already set up my servers. Um, let's start that. We can't do that easily today, which is a problem. Uh, the other issue is, is we've run into, too, is the fabric, right? You look at the leaf spine fabric. It's how do I get that set up? And then is that just my data traffic or is that my control traffic as well? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, everything gets up at network. Right. You figure it out from This network and stuff's so difficult. It's still <laughs> problem. <laughs> right. Because, yeah. right. right. you know, it's, it's, I, need, I need my management network up to get Kubernetes up and the fabric running because we, we we're running Onos under Kubernetes. But then once it's up, I should be able to switch everything over to the fabric interfaces and do everything on the fabric interfaces. But then if the fabric interface goes down, you're screwed again, right? And so I think decisions and discussion around that has to happen as well. Do we keep kind of control out of band on a management network and just use the fabric for data, or do we try to do everything over the fabric? Right? I mean, in terms of onus, I, I you know, I also think well, we're going off container, but I think I think the fabric needs to be a plug-in too. If you're doing leaf spine great, if you're doing something else great. It needs to be kind of a, a change of the And so again, I think a lot of it is, let's assume you have your underlay, let's assume you have your physical hosts, your, your container orchestration system set up. Now can we go from that point and start deploying? I, I, you could say you just, you kind of put all the hard problems under the rug <laughs> yeah. And you have a little bit. It's just kind of separate. Kind of well, yeah. it's, it's, you, you put all the hard problems under the rug, but in practice, in, in my experience, it's been easier to solve the hard problems than try to deploy core. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so, so with your guys' work, that's been an idea. Yes. Yeah. What kind of use cases do you have? Are you just trying to get your like, so. Basically, test traffic through test containers. The, the big focus, though, that I mentioned it has been AJ. I want to be able to kill a compute node and just rewrite everything. I want to be able to kill anything and everything and have it come back. So, yeah, so the demo they, they, uh, Ken did a while ago was uh, we had no LT with the PC behind it. And we had internet that essentially showing a YouTube video going uh, up through the fabric into a container based VSG. So we took the existing cord VSG, pulled it out of the VM, and just ran it as a container. Um, that was chained via Spinetti with layer two tunnels. And then that would went out the internet. We didn't have um, the Quagga router at the time, so we're kind of going up the management you know, across the fabric and up the management interface with the internet because we didn't have all the, the gateways in place. And then you could essentially find out where the VSG was running and kill that server. And then Kubernetes would notice it was down, it would restart the VSG and on another host. Spinetti would see the, the new thing up, chain it up, and traffic would resume. So that was kind of the use case. Um, there's been a lot of focus that Ken sent on, on the HA aspect, right, which we, we don't see in court today right now. One of your hosts goes down, or something goes down. You're wiping and starting over, and um, that's a pain, and it's also very time-consuming. Um, does it work perfectly? No, we've run into problems with the fabric um, right now, and I'll talk about this later. Uh, one of the troubles talks. The well, fabric's not working. The config worked yesterday. It doesn't work today. I've restarted everything. Oh my gosh, why doesn't it work? <laughs> it's been a month of that. That has been yeah. my last month. Okay. 
so there's that, you know, there's some learnings that we had to do tweaking around Kubernetes in terms of timeouts for when things that turn dead. So we'll restart those type of things. Um, you know, it, if you unplug a host all of a sudden, a Kubernetes master is like, well, the host isn't there, but I don't necessarily know if the host has gone away or I'm split brained and there's timeouts that have to take in the thing. I think these are learnings that we go through and saying what happens when we deploy under Kubernetes, what are the proper settings? I think we'll see, um, you know, as uh, Tom Manchowitz was talking, AT&T will have different settings than Deutsche Telekom, right? They have different, <laughs> different priorities, and, and, and so you'll see some customization around that. But we can at least start learning and documenting that. But, um, again, as I said, I like the reactive model because I like that kind of distributed processing model. I think from a failover point of view, it has some real advantages. Um, not everything's going through central processing. It's not, you know, that type of thing. Um, so we've learned a lot. Can they do everything? I don't know. We're learning. Okay. Uh, are we re-implementing what you could call a control room? Or someone like it that, right? <laughs> but I honestly think, again, I, I think Onos needs to be re-implemented in a microservices approach, too. So I can see it, you know, taking the core of Onos out as one container and then taking the VTN out as another container. Or something like that. I think that plays into it. So is, is all of that open source? Yes, Kubernetes yeah. is all open source. Um, I, I'll, after this meeting, I'll post a discussion loop, uh, list. I'll, I'll post a link to the YouTube video again, as well as to the GitHub where we Spinetti is yeah. there. Uh, great. Um, you're saying we can make that the entire Aqua use case. Pretty much. I mean, there's always some caveats, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're running, um, we've got Spinetti, we're running Onos as a container. There's another container that you know, pushes config at Onos. The fabric has always been an issue, right? And when you get to a court installation, back to the network, it's a hard part, right? <laughs> and that's always going to be a pain. And hopefully, I mean, Trellis is evolving to speak better, but it's still a pain. So, um, and there's things that we didn't document, like we have the, uh, We'll have DPA start up automatically on the switch and so. Um, so we need people to help start building this. I mean, are people interested in hoping someone else builds it? Or, <laughs> or are people, people have resources that are, are ready to help out and they just need, you know, please could you do this? I mean, that, that's kind of because I haven't seen any of that. This is the where the going to be doing this. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, and I, I was, um, before this conference, someone was asking me about the brigade. I was like, it, it's, and it's my fault, but we'll take money for it. It's kind of floundered, for lack of a better term. Because, you know, it got started and then Volta happened. Ali left. <laughs> and I got pulled in that direction. <laughs> Ali was from Owen Labs, if you guys don't know, he was we're gonna pull them. Um, and with him, someone else from Seattle left, and so I got pulled into both them. And so it's kind of floundered in that direction. Ken's been doing some work, great work from my perspective, on Spinetti and that type of stuff. But and then Gopi came and he kind of went in a different direction and still kind of under the container umbrella. And I think that caused confusion, not purposely, I mean just because there was lack of direction. Um, when he started saying direction, I, my ears perked up because I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's two, there's two distinct use cases. Like, so yeah. Right? We should probably try and keep them both the same. Yeah. So that I'm just fine with you. I agree. Um, okay, so. I mean, we can. I can work with Gopi to make sure we have some clearer directions and steps that we. We would like, but you know, we're going to need feedback. Like this, yeah, yeah. if I say this is, hey, we could try this, and it's completely stupid. I mean, someone to say, other than John, I'm hoping John and maybe Brian will say, <laughs> will say, hey, this is completely stupid. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> um, again, I, I mean, you know, I'm interested in what you guys are doing too. What you guys, what you guys want out of a container for this? Anybody? What do you guys want? Yeah, I guess for us. Besides, we 
whether it is looking for the card control plane services or you are forcing everyone to move the container as a VM. Once you get that, then pretty much everything. See, from my perspective, I want to force everybody to be a uh, container VNS. Um, Gogi does not, he, he, he envisions eventually maybe, but for a, a significant time period, we're still going to have VM VNS. Um, but can you pull that under Kubernetes? VM, uh, VM, but deployed as a container. So there was a, someone, someone wrote, I think it was, was it Gopi that pointed at some, uh, there was a there was Kubernetes extension. Talk about that. Yeah, the Kubernetes extension I where you can start VMs. Yeah. I, I, I kind of cringed, I got to admit. If you think about it, Google Cloud is doing the same thing. Yeah. Because the Google, Google Cloud VMs are actually containers for Google itself. So Google's bar is orchestrating it, right? Right. So it, it's a container inside that QVM is being done. So that's how they have been doing it. But most people are familiar with container VMs rather than VM yeah, container. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you are saying Kubernetes is the platform, then uh, VM in a container makes much more sense, right? Rather than supporting an entire stack just to orchestrate VMs versus an entire stack just to orchestrate containers. So, that's, so, so you're saying something like, we we'll just run a VM in a container, map the what? About the networking directly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the only caveat out there is I, I want to be careful that Kubernetes isn't the platform. It's the one we're probably going to start with. But it'd be great to be able to do this with Swarm or Mesosphere as well. And I know there's some differences between them. Right? I just, it, it just, again, my fear is locking, going from one locked in platform to another locked in platform doesn't really. Right, you know, drive us forward because Larry's right. Six months from now, there could be something else, right? And so I, I think you know, separating the container behavior from the platform is on is, is useful if we can get away with it. But if you're unit, at least you are uh, kind of deciding that the unit of packaging and deployment is a container. Yeah, I think so. But, I mean, how likely do we think it is that all VNS will use containers? Right now, we have a lot of VNS developed. We're going to have one, it's all just like VM transfer. How do we get it? Please? Well, we ask them. Well, we're going to come to our doctors then. That's great. What time is it? Yeah. Here I'm 
go through XOS or maybe outside of XOS for this demo, because who knows? And you know, I'm going to go start the service, be an F chain, and that's going to go interface to Kubernetes or whatever the container management system is, to set up that chain. I think if you keep pushing the angle of what you just said, and then you type this, and the port is running and deployed, boom, that might get people that don't even, they hear the word container, and they're like, oh, I don't know what that is. I'll look the other way. Right. But if you really sell it on the use case of, wow, three lines of bash, and I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I think if you can demonstrate that and compare it to the current point, that's a Right. 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 Exactly. At, at least for those users who who don't care to build core. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most users would rather not build the software they use, it's, unless they're changing. Right? I think yeah, I think people have, yeah. There's the core core developers who want to build software, and then there's the service developers who don't want to build the core. They just want to build their service bits, and then there's the operators who just want to deploy things. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to build macOS, right? No, right? No. You don't want to build your IDE. You know, there's a there's a whole bunch of stuff which is sort of below the, the line, so to speak, for, yeah. for your personal perspective. And thinking about those users is making it, you know, how do I do it in three lines? Yeah. And I think that's missing from core today, and I think it's, you know, it's at release four, but that's because the release number is all screwed up. We're really pre-release one. <laughs> Even when the core thing changed, because some upstream package changed everything. Right? Like, I didn't change anything. I just want to redeploy the same setup. Yeah. I didn't download any new code. I just want to say deploy again. But now something has broken because somebody changed the uh, Ansible package version in some other repository. And <laughs> yeah, when, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember those problems. <laughs> so, Pretty easy. Yeah, they're, they're, we had a problem with Git version for a while, an Ansible version. Um, so that means you're not actually downloading all the stuff you need onto the Hit node of the developer node. I think mean, there are still something. Well, I think currently it does have this stuff. It's not being well, when, when you say deploy, it basically, the first thing, at, at least at one point, I'm not sure if this is still true, but at one point you put some, you type deploy, and it would instantly go, okay, re download everything and re <laughs> all of it. And then push it to. Yeah. Um, at least we're not using Gradle anymore. <laughs> That's a move in the right direction. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, and again, one of the things I like about containers is, at least from a deployment perspective, you've got some isolation around some of that version and stuff, which is nice. Um, as long as you're running the right kernel version. <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions? I'm, I'm interested here if, if you guys can talk about more um, issues you've had with migrating to the uh, next one. Yeah. Networking is number one. Other than that. Yeah, multi networks is a problem because current, uh, most in the case of the appliances, right? It, it, Call it middle box for a reason. Yeah, yeah, sure. They don't transmit, they, they don't terminate, they don't generate. They are just a transit field. So they have the multi networks. So Kubernetes out of the box doesn't support it, Docker kind of supports it, so we can use that. Um, yeah. I guess Docker changing frequently. They're just changes to. Or across different, okay. like Docker, Docker Compose, Docker, and Docker Swarm. <laughs> Like there is no consistency yeah. between what features are implemented across all the things. So that keeps changing. So. Yeah, you, you often end up going back to Docker as kind of the least common denominator yeah. and ignoring everything else. <laughs> Which has everything, right? Yeah. But then you will lose all your and, and, and all the new features, too. Yeah. Like if you're depending on some newer feature or so we needed Kef oh, okay. So we started deploying to Docker Swarm. Uh, uh, what happened was uh, uh, it, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, capabilities are yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so and capabilities we need uh, pseudo. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, so that doesn't mean. Yeah, you, you can't give yourself privs if you're running a right, Docker Compose type of it's more. Yeah, Docker Compose right. supports yeah. it, regular Docker supports it, but Swarm doesn't more support it. Yeah. Kubernetes supports Kubernetes it. Kubernetes does support it, yeah. So, like, where's the consistency? Yeah. yeah. And 
and that is definitely required for uh, next admin capability and uh, for us it was IPC uh, yeah. it, it Definitely it was a nice learning experience to see what your app is actually doing. Like for most people it's like, it works. <laughs> I compile it. It has some dependencies. It writes some config files somewhere, etc. With this, you are exactly documenting. So it's a nice experience to what it depends on. It makes you get your dependencies perfectly yeah. straight and yeah. it helps you into Whether it is configuration files or whatever it is, it's a good thing to have this way. Even if you end up running inside a VM. It was just surprising what we had hard coded. Basically, oh yeah, the, it will figure it out will all the hard coded stuff and because it will immediately break because that thing is yeah. not there in the right place. And then when you try to auto scale it, you have different config files. Like ah, that, yeah. So, figuration is working. Yes. Yeah, it gives you a nice path, uh, a fast path to fail and say that this won't work in multiple instance scenarios. Or this is how you have hard coded, so it won't work if you have multiple instances. Because still that point, it's so difficult to even set up multiple instances that you wouldn't have gone to that problem. But with Docker, it's like up, 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 yeah, and, yeah, yeah. but then it doesn't work. Because, yeah, how do you manage configuration for each instance in stateful application? Right? So. Stateful is always a, a pain anytime you're in the distributed system, so. Um, Besides networking, is like a persistent volume. Unless you're running off on the same host, you're actually like by mounting a, a host directory. It's just I want to save this like across the cluster, and I can't. Unless it's where you can just the distributed file systems like cluster FS or something like mm -hmm. that, or use a SAN remote SAN and mount that. Yeah, I think storage yeah, you can. Well. Yeah, they have the storage, different storage drivers. Yeah, I, I looked into it. I looked into it a while ago, so it, uh, may, Wolf, it may have changed. Wolf is actually using ClusterFS. Um, they're doing it a little differently. They're using ClusterFS under Swarm, and so the same mount points available on all hosts, and they they mount the one locally. But I, some of the drivers I know didn't work. Um, I tried to use. I think it was the cluster FS driver, the storage driver, and then whether I had it configured wrong or something didn't work. But that's the idea. You should be able to do that. I've used the Git driver to pull down a config file for Kronos on GitHub. But yeah, there is some ways to do it. It's, it's just one of the things that worries me because there's, there's no one set way to do it. And also, it's it lives outside the containers, right? But whatever the solution is, yeah. it's another thing that has to be actually deployed on the host. You can't yeah. just like swarm swarm water or compose or there is some infrastructure set up and again we've seen that in Volta. So like Volta has, you know, um, console and Kafka with the consider infrastructure, which is set up before you start running really any of the Volta containers. And part of that is because console doesn't play either of those play nice in orchestration systems. Um, mostly for the RAP inside protocol stuff, but um, and expecting static IP addresses. <laughs> but there are some things like that that we have to deal with. Um, console's been a pain. <laughs> so, okay. It's not it's not just an OS problem. Well the fun I've had with those cluster. <laughs> So, so like if you wanted to run um, any kind of database, um, so you can put just an example, if you want to run XOS or any other um, management system in containers, you want to be able to fail over between hosts, yeah. but at the same time, if you lose the hosts, right now you lose the volume. Yeah, that depends on like, uh, I mean, you, you can all solve it, right? So, uh, this, this, uh, the, you can basically put it in the commodity cloud or whatever, right? So, you can all solve it. It depends on the price of the volume. You can use it. It's a volume. It's a volume. It's a volume. It's a volume. So, otherwise, you can basically just use the commodity cloud. Then you can forget about it. What do you mean by commodity cloud? You can use them to a cloud AWS. Right, right, right. But okay, if if you're not worried about 
thing too, then you could go yeah. get some of the stuff. So, so yeah. it's more if, like, assuming a pure core component of just, like, user of my compute, this is my storage, this is my, right, then how do I save it so it's distributed and saved here? And you see, that, that's where when you set up your, your cluster, you're going to have compute resources in it, storage resources in it, and then you're going to do um, distributed remote file system to the storage unit, and then your container would move out that distributed remote file system. So it have a container that essentially runs console or PC pool or whatever, and they talk to the shared volume. See, but then the promise that like, your machine allows the storage unit to work in other systems. That's again, this is if you want it, right? It, uh, this is. Um, what am I say? If when when you're building out a data center, Google does this every day, right? I have my compute resources, my storage resources, I've allocated those. And so when a carrier builds out, yeah, it's different. Anyway, I mean, when you build out your own your own cluster, you're gonna you're gonna dedicate something for storage. You're gonna have a SAN. And you just gotta make that available. SAN is a typical way to build it, but it's not. Really yeah. But there's a kind of similar with Kubernetes. There's a project called Loop. Called what? R O O K. Yeah. Uh, which kind of spins up, uh, I think, set containers uh, and uh, provide you uh, like a storage cluster out of your computer. So there's no difference between storage nodes and computer okay. nodes. It will do the hard work for you. And it must be doing redundancy stored in a multiple. Yeah, it will, it will keep, yeah, that, that so is the kind of like a RAID 5 yeah. on your storage. Or on the set will do it for you. Yeah. Uh, Rook's job is to implement the operator pattern in Kubernetes and correctly spin up these containers, yeah. which in turn will do the uh, look at that placement. And yeah. then you can essentially mount yeah. into that system. Look, look at that one, that's actually yeah. cool. Works so, with the name of the old card game. <laughs> What's the limitation of console? Any... Console had some issues with its um, RAF implementation, and, and it expects the uh, quorum people that are invoked, kind of the quorum, to have uh, well-known static IP addresses. And that can be difficult when you're running an under orchestration environment. <laughs> I think it's console, I believe, ECB is the same issue. Yeah. I haven't found one yet that is just like so. So the, that's the issue around it. So both are running some problems in terms of starting up console, and if there's a failure in console and you want to fail over one of the containers, it ran into problems as well. All right, we're over. Um, if you have any questions, email me dbaybry at sienna.com or Slack me. I don't know, I think I'm on Slack. <laughs> container brigade, container brigade, that like discuss. Um, and thank you very much.